الحمد لله العظيم الخبير المتعالي الحمد لله الذي لا تحجبه ظلمات الليالي الحمد لله الذي أرسل جبال العوالي سبحانه من إله عظيم يغفر الذنوب ولا يبالي لا إله إلا الله بها نحيا وبها نموت وبها نلقى الله وبها نوالي وأشهد أن عظيمنا وقدوتنا ومولانا قرة عيني محمد ابن عبد الله عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله أرسله كافة للناس بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا فبلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة فكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين فصلوات ربي وسلامه عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وبعد um, Dear ones, um, I will speak until I see that you're bored in which case I will stop and then go to my next commitment um, I pray that's okay uh, is there anyone in rush to go somewhere after this okay um, but um, so inshallah ta'ala the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam of the signs of prophethood was the prophecies that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam made of the prophecies he made, a segment is prophecies of the end of time. Meaning, signs, alamat, that when these things happen, note that the hour is nigh, the hour is near. Why? For a few reasons. Um, probably the most prominent of the reasons is so that the akhirah, the life to come is always at the forefront of the Muslim's head. So any time you become ghafil, you forget um, and you go into the affairs of the dunya and a sign comes, you go, oh, akhirah. You know, like when you're traveling from here, I don't know your country too well, but just from here to Birmingham, um, along the way you kind of um, get, you know, you do, uh, not doze off, but you kind of get into your own world. Then a sign comes up, you know, 50 miles to Birmingham or whatever. The, it, it's to wake you up again so you don't miss the ex exits, you don't miss the lanes and so on and so forth. So one of its key reasons, I won't go through all of it because that's not my topic, um, is, is for that. So tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we will touch on whatever signs Allah Rabbul Izza uh, allows us time-wise to touch on in a chronological sequence. So I'll start with the first one. And the reason I'm doing this is a few. One is I know Sheikh Murtaza is doing uh, the Dajjal with you guys on, on Sunday. Sheikh Sahih? Yeah. So that's one of the major signs. But I'm starting from the first of the signs. So the first sign, the Prophet and I'll draw some lessons from it, inshallah. So the first of the signs um, is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Bu'ithtu ana wassa'atu kahatain. I, as in my advent, my prophethood, my coming, and the hour are like this. Meaning that the advent of the Prophet was a sign of the signs of the Day of Judgment. Uh, can I get a bit technical with you? So when the Rasul says this, kahatain, the scholars went into what does it mean? Automatically, any human can deduce that it means proximity, like next to one another. Yeah? And you would be right to ask, but Ustaz, 14 and a half centuries ago, he said like this, and 14 and a half centuries have passed, and what this? You know, kahatain. So the Ahl al-Ilm explained that so far as uh, the chain of prophethoods are concerned, 
So, you know, Adam and Nuh and on and on and on to our prophet. The Rasul came. No more prophets will come. Straight away, uh, Qiyamah will come. You with me? So there's not three steps. There's another prophet. And it's me and then Qiyamah. One. Second is they say in reference to the gap in the middle, like as in proximity this way, next to it. Um, if you look at geological time, like as in the time the earth has existed and the sun has existed, um, and, uh, you know, uh, compared to that, 14 and a half centuries or more or less is, is, a, is a blink of an eye. In our day today, long time, but so far as the time of the world is concerned, and we have a hadith, the Prophet wasallam was with the Ashab, the sun was setting. You know when the sun goes after Asr, so the sun's climbing, then it reaches the Zawal, and then it comes down, there comes a section where it's just dropping. You know, there's no more slow, it's just a drop. So this after Asr, before Maghrib, you know, with, with, so around, the sun is there. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and, and a, Rasul is a teacher, Alayhi Afdallah Salatu Wa Tammu Taslim, he tells the Sahaba, he says, compared to what is past and what is left of the world is tantamount to what is left of this day. As in most of it done. So if they say the sun is four and a half billion years old. Um, most of it's done. The last drop is left. So a tafsir is this. The other is the scholars say because you need to understand that your heritage, your deen comes from a lot of thought and analysis. So if the Rasul did this, people sat and said, hold on, what did he mean? You know, and, and for most of us up to this date, you said this, okay, it means close. But the Ahl al-Ilm sat and, and then they said, no, he meant this gap. Not, are you guys following me? Um, so he meant this gap as in between this finger and this finger. With different intents, showing uh, magnitude, uh, size of, of event. Meaning me, then the big event, Qiyamah. You, you understand? So Kahatain, the advent of the Rasul, huge event. Then Qiyamat, next one up. Or that the gap between these two in reference to time, like that much more in Qiyamat. Irrespective, the advent of the Rasul was the sign of the signs of the Day of Judgment. So that's our first one. The second sign happened in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. So it is a full moon night. And full moon nights, you see, because we live in an age of popular, uh, of uh, Massive population, with it, massive pollution. So we have noise pollution, we have dirt pollution, we have, and we have light pollution. So with light, you go out, you look up, you can't see the stars. Have you UK people seen stars before? <laughs> so in our part, Habibi, don't look upset. If you've seen it, you've seen it. You know, not a big deal. So in our parts, pollution is low. And because Australia is very big land, very small population. We're a continent and only 25 million people. Um, so when you drive out a bit into the bush and there's no lights, you see the stars like that. 
like it's an amazing, amazing uh, observation. But there's no other light. There's no city. It's just it's dark, and then these lights, and then on a full moon night, it's glorious. So in the time of the Rasul, alayhi afdal salatu wa tamu taslim, you can deduce that the full moon night was a, a picnic night. You know, Arabs, Allah bless them, Ya Rab, they are people that try to make the best of, of situations. Like I just came from Mecca. Uh, again, I'm from Australia, context very different. So we have parks and we have uh, this and that. Uh, I saw people on the side of the road next to a mountain. They've sat down, they've put their, uh, their little picnic thing uh, and they're sitting. So I asked the taxi driver, what are they doing? He goes, uh, oh, picnic, sayaha, you know. I said, Allah bless it for them. So they used to look for, so a full moon night was a great excuse to get together. So they used to come outside, haram is there, and their little circles they used to sit, tribes used to sit talk, laughter, drink. So full moon night and the Rasul walks out. Alayhi afdal salatu wa tammu taslim. The Quraysh are gathered in their circles, in their picnic place, if you call it that. So then they notice, I, I, am, I am explaining the hadith, this is not the matn of the hadith, yeah, because I don't, uh, because you have to make people understand. So they see the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam coming and they come up to him because the Rasul is the talk of the city. Like every house, it's what Muhammad has brought. And this son has become a Muslim and the father hasn't. And in this house, the father has become Muslim. And the slave of this, it's, it's the talk of town. So now they see him come. So some gather around him. If you claim to be the prophet of God, then ask, so what's the, what's the big thing? The moon. Ask your Lord to split this. And then join it back together and we'll believe. We'll accept you're a prophet. So the Prophet wasallam prayed, asked Allah Rabbul Izzah. Allah Rabbul Izzah granted him uh, the miracle. And he wasallam pointed to the moon. And Makkah is watching. This is not a small event. You know, Makkah is watching. Everyone's come because the man's on the spot. What do you do? And imagine he does this and nothing happens. And, you know, goes, again, what? they're watching, they're waiting, anticipating, hoping for failure because done. And then, alayhi afdalu salatu wa tammu taslim, points and brings it this way. Some of the narrations say, one on this side of a mountain and one on this side of a mountain. And other narrations say, brought one towards one mountain and one towards another mountain. Both can be joined together. Makkah is very mountainous. Probably over one mountain, near another mountain. Ala kulli hal. The Quran said, Iqtarabati sa'atu al qamar. The hour has come nigh and the moon split. Meaning, this is a sign, no doubt about it, in the presence of the Rasul. The Prophet is alive, the Sahaba are alive, Mecca is there. Verse confirms it as a sign. Therefore, this is the second of our signs of the day. By ours, I mean of this gathering um, that I am taking, uh, of the signs of the day of judgment. You still with me? Should I go on or are we good? Allah protect you, Ya Rab. So, um, and then to point something important out, now they see it, now what? Huh? So they go, nah, he did magic on us. You see, it's a point that miracles are not a cause of belief. Do you understand me? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hasn't entertained a lot of show us, give us signs, give us signs. Because when you ask for signs, you increase the doubt in your heart. Because they saw, but they didn't believe. Iman, 
requires that you get a certain degree of evidence, then you make the leap of faith that you believe in everything unseen. You with me? Habibi, I don't want to make people uncomfortable, but is the temperature okay or too hot? Yeah, I have a rosacea problem. My face burns, so Allah bless you. And they're all wrapped up enough, so they, they should be fine. Allah honor you, Ya Rabb. So we'll move to our next one. Um, where's Haddad? All right, no, just time wise. So, next one, the Prophet وسلم, prophesizes. This prophecy happened in the Battle of Tabuk. So, Tabuk is the last of the campaigns of the Prophet. And very difficult campaign. And he وسلم, marched out in the thick of summer. Can I ask a question? Anyone been in the summer of Mecca? Uh, in, in the summer of Saudi? Uh, different, separate ball game. Separate ball game. I was in Umrah in summer and I wanted to kiss the stone, the Hajar al Aswad. So there were some people in it, uh, near it in, at Fajr time. So I figured, Khalas, I'll come at Zuhur, no one will be here. So I came at Zuhur. And I was wearing my, my scarf and um, coming out of the hotel, undercover area, because the mosque, you know, the haram has all, you know, before this uh, current situation. And um, as I got out from under the cover, because I wanted to go and kiss the stone, and pff, like as though someone's got a hairdryer on high in front of your face, you know. So I took three steps, then ran back. I said, no, I'll come back at Asr for this Hot, hot. Um, you guys won't appreciate it because heat doesn't come to London, you know, so gentle relatively for you. But the desert, hot. So thick of the heat, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marched. Um, all the way to the precipice of Bilad al-Sham. And then waited there and then came back. This campaign is called Tabuk. So Auf ibn Malik says that I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fi ghazwati Tabuk wa huwa fi qubbatim min Adam. I came to him in the campaign of Tabuk and he was in a tent made of leather. So Auf Ibn Malik came in in one of the narrations. He says, can I come in? So the Rasul said, come in. So then Auf said, all of me? So the Rasul said, all of you. And this, this delicate little moment shows the relationship of the Rasul with the companions. When Auf says, all of me, it's a joke. In the middle of the, all the difficulty, you know, with the Rasul of Allah, but they had this uh, relationship and proximity and joy and happiness uh, that he says this, so he came. And then the Rasul, remember, the, where, where's the campaign? You, you have to engage with me, dear ones. Where's the campaign? Tabuk. Tabuk. So in Tabuk, the Rasul makes the following prophecy. He says, Udud sitam bayna yaday sa'a. Count, watch, look out for these six things between now and the hour. As in, I'm giving you six signs, Ya'uf. And amazing that he gives it in Tabuk, because the signs, all of it, link around Tabuk. You see, when you want someone to memorize something, remember something, you link it to something. Successful memory techniques. So you link 
this name with this place or you link this with that. that. So the Prophet wasallam mentioned Tabuk. Like in Tabuk, mention this and predominantly it will, it will unfold in the same area. So the first of the signs, he said, Mauti, my death. So his advent is a sign. His death is a sign of the signs of the day of judgment. And the Prophet ﷺ passed away on the 11th year after Hijrah, on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. On the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. So, and the hardest, saddest moment in human history let alone Islamic history, is the demise of the Rasul. Alayhi afdalu salatu wa tammu taslim. Me and you, in our days, we hear about it. it. It touches the hearts. They actually saw the Prophet and then they had to bury him. Uh, Fatima radiallahu anha asks Anas, he goes, how were, you so, how were you able to bear throwing sand on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So he said, our, our, our soul hearts couldn't bear it, but the Amr of the Rasul had to be obeyed. So, hard moment, and the Sahaba were bewildered to the point that they couldn't accept. So you know the famous story, Umar ibn al-Khattab um, came out with his sword, whoever says, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has died, I will cut off his head. You munafiks, the Prophet hasn't died. The Prophet went as Musa went and he will come back because the heart can't accept. And other Sahaba fell to the ground and hard point. And how do you recover? Think about it. The leader, the institutor, the founder, the legislator, the commander, the strategist, the link between heaven and earth has gone. How do you recover? Like how do you continue? Where do you get the motivation from? And here, uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu comes out with his timeless utterance. مَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ مُحَمَّدًا فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْ مَاتْ وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيُّ اللَّهَ يَمُوتْ And whoever worshipped Muhammad, Muhammad has died. And whoever worshipped Allah, then Allah Rabbu Al-Izza is eternal and doesn't die. And then he recites, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا Muhammad was not but a prophet. Prophets have died before him. If he were to have died or is no more, then would you turn on your heels and leave the mission and leave the deen? And Umar say, and Umar, Umar, Umar radiallahu an Umar. So he says, Ya yeah, Abu Bakr, this is in the Quran. Like Abu Bakr came to the pulpit and mentioned this. And Umar says it was as though like they have heard it. The verses are part of the Quran. They have recited it. But they never made the link that he would die. You know, so they kept it so far buried and they, they, no, he will, you understand me? That wouldn't even cross their minds. So when he heard it, he fell down. And then Abu Bakr said, yes, and Allah says, إِنَّكَ مَيِّتُونَ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ O Muhammad, you will die and they will die. But an important point, the verse Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu references is a lesson for us and for all the Muslims that difficulties will come, setbacks will come, pain will come, heartache will come, death will come, as a matter of course. But none of those should ever affect or deter or hold back the da'wah. Remember dear ones, 
So from it we learn that we are a people who live for a mission. So make yourselves and your families people that live for the mission that the Prophet ﷺ lived for. Because notice, whilst he was alive, the deen was in the jazeera. The deen was in the jazeera. After his death, within a short few decades, it reached Granada and Spain on one side and New Delhi and India on the other. How did it reach? Because lots of movements, lots of religions, lots of ideas came and went into the dustbins of history because the followers didn't take, up on, take the mission up. But as he fell, as the Prophet passed away, Straight away Abu Bakr commands the Jaysh of Usama radiallahu an, Go complete your mission Because mission focused people uh, They lived for a purpose Live for a purpose dear ones All other stuff has no meaning Like wallahi al-azim they are doing so much to make the world about money. You know, wear a Rolex watch. Drive a Bugatti. You understand? Look posh. Ask the person, like if he's honest to himself, after putting on that fancy watch, what changed? Heart, same heart. Sadness, same sadness. Problem, same problem. Weather, same weather. You went and nothing wrong, Habib. If you have it, Allah bless you. I don't want the person with Rolex here saying, you know, that's what did you do? Point. They're trying to make us live for material things, which does nothing. And after you've got it, you think, why? You know, all for fame. And after you become famous, you think, what a musibah. Before I could have coffee by myself, now I have coffee and I have to look, see who's taking a picture. You understand? Whatever they think the hal is, whatever they're aspiring, so empty, so hollow, so nothing. If there was any khair in it, the Rasul would have done it. Like the hadith says, if the dunya had the weight of the wing of a fly or mosquito, Allah wouldn't have given it to, to the people that don't believe in him. Nothing to him. Point, dear ones, what is grand, what is expensive, what, what will add value to your life, what will give meaning to your existence, what will make your life better lives is when you live lives of purpose. Dear ones, Live lives of purpose so that in salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillah Everything that I do is for Allah Rabbah. That's a good life. And they had no regret. Watch every sahabi. Watch every sahabi. None of them came to a point and think, ah, I wish, you know, we did all this for nothing. We shouldn't have done all this. Confused, bewildered. Um, should it, shouldn't. Until the end, until they, they went under the ground, lives of a hundred percent meaning, lives of a hundred percent devotion, the akhirah was a reality to them. It was a reality to them. Bilal radiallahu anhu at the point of death, his wife says, um, you know, oh, what calamity, what sadness, my husband's dying. Uh, I will be a widow. The companion of the Rasul is going. Look at Bilal at the point of death. He says, Tomorrow, just tomorrow, just, just tomorrow, we will be with the Prophet, with the beloved the Prophet and the companions. Alhamdulillah, that this part finished. I'm going to the real one. You know, do you see? Clarity till the end, conviction to the end, devotion till the end, purpose to the end, life to the end. And go watch others die. 
Go watch others die, watch the confusion, watch the eyes moving from side to side, watch the fear, watch the anxiety, watch the gripping onto the world that they built whole hospitals to keep them here. And with hospitals and, uh, you know, a special units and everything Allah Rabbul Izza calls and you go and through the same hospital you designed to keep you here. Through that Allah takes you. You go and, the, and monarchs go to the real monarch because the real world is just the world that Allah Rabbul Izza has for us on the other side. This one is a fleeting moment, fleeting moment. Focus dear ones on the next one. Don't don't sell that one for this one. What a calamity. What a calamity if you sell the Akhirah for dunya. So, mawti, my death. As in the death of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he says, ثُمَّ فَتْحُ بَيْتِ Maqdis. Then the conquest of Baytul Maqdis, of Jerusalem. And notice, where was the Prophet when he made the prophecy? Tabuk. Tabuk is near to Jerusalem. Same. Bilad al-Sham. And on the way. You know. And the miracle of the Hadith is not only that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam establish the six things. You know, he could have said, Mawti wa fathu bayt al-Maqdis. But he said, Mawti, ha? Thumma fathu bayt al-Maqdis. Thumma, uh, in Arabic, meaning some time will pass and then this. You know what? It could be this or that. You don't know which one came first or second. Thumma, this, then this. So if the prophecy was reversed, it would be nullified. Like if the order were to be changed, it is not a miracle. It not, can't be a prophetic statement. But the Prophet wasallam. not only did he say these things will happen, which happen, but also the order in which these things will happen. Thumma fathu bayt al-Maqdis. So as he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prophesied, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died in the 11th year after Hijrah. Um, and in the Khilafat of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anh, Allah Rabbu al-Izza opened bayt al-Maqdis. Um, and you know the famous story of Bayt al-Maqdis. Um, the archbishop of the city um, refused to surrender the keys of the city and the cathedral except to the Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Aba Hafsin, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu So they sent news, the general, they sent news to Medina that Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, they say come here and receive the keys of surrender. So, uh, what would go down in history as a extraordinary moment, the Khalifa, who is taking over one of the main cities of, of the Roman Empire, is going to make the trek from Medina, from Medina to Bayt al Maqdis on a camel with a single servant through the desert. And they would take turns, sometimes the servants riding, ah, radiyallahu anka ya Umar. He's holding the, the ropes, the reins, walking in front of the camel. Sometimes Umar's on the camel, the servant is walking. And like this, they make the journey. And when they reach the precipice of the city, outside the city, 
the the servant is wise enough to know that listen yeah mur al mu'minin we're going in people are waiting um, the protocol demands that at least you ride you know you didn't bring an entourage خلاص you know you didn't bring but here the camel is there i am here i'll i'll get on the floor you so umar said no there is enough honor in the deen for both of us so allah and then the famous statement nahnu qawmun a'azzana allah bi deenihi فمهما طلبنا العزة في غير ما أعزنا الله به أذلنا الله We are a people that Allah honored through his deen So and if we choose or seek honor in something other than the deen Allah will humiliate us So Allah honored him Through time and space So that today In 2020 End of 2022 In this city of London Wahaj comes to tell you the story of one that did this 14 and a half centuries ago because Allah honored him through time and space because for him he opted for the honor of Islam as sufficient. And sufficient an honor it is. Everyone else that came with pomp and ceremony and um, you know beating drums went into the dustbins of history you will not even know their names. And yet Allah elevated Umar so that even today, in this part of the world, Umar is being mentioned. <coughs> so, um, Umar Kam radiallahu anhu ardah. So dear ones, um, remember this. Be confident, unapologetic Muslims. I don't, I, 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 I'm very particular with my words. Uh, confident, unapologetic Muslims. I don't need you to be arrogant. I don't need you to be rude. I don't need you to be harsh. I don't need you to be cold. I need you to be confident. Unapologetic. This is who we are, Habibi. You know, my beard like this. Um, I pray five times a day. I do this and I do this. This is it. This is us. Do you understand? We are confident in our heritage, confident in our faith, confident in our Lord, confident uh, in our religion, confident in ourselves, confident in our belief in our Lord. So listen. Second is note that the archbishop gave him the keys of the cathedral and then invited him to pray inside it. Where? Jerusalem. So Umar, the conqueror, the one who has come to take the surrender of the city, says, I will not pray inside your, your, your cathedral. Because if I do, my people might see it as my place of worship and take it from you. So I will pray outside at the steps instead, out of my respect, so that, you know, your, what is your religious property remains intact to you. But I will pray outside. Um, so Islam, when it was at its peak and at its mightiest, was benevolent, was gracious, was accepting, was tolerant. Um, so they didn't, they didn't smash down the, the churches. They didn't, um, they didn't kill inhabitants. And don't think this is ordinary in those days. You know, some centuries later, the crusaders came and took the city. And you read the chron uh, chronicles of history. They wrote to His Holiness that our horses up to their knees walk in the blood of Muslims and Jews. I, I, I'm not, like, I want to contrast uh, paradigms that this is what we are about. And, and for some strange reason, for this, they have managed to create the image of this. You know, 
Allah bless and protect Ya Rabbi. So another lesson to to remember. Uh, how am I doing? Five minutes. Another lesson. To, ha. Um, if you get tired and you need to go, uh, just quietly say salam and just walk out. I'll continue. So. Um, Second lesson to learn is that be gracious in every matter of life. Be gracious. The difficulty will pass, be gracious. The good will pass, be gracious. If you have won, be gracious. If you have lost, be gracious. In your family, be gracious. Paying your debt, be gracious. Even in divorce, be gracious. Bidalil, qala ta'ala, wa la tansaw al fadla baynakum. Don't forget grace amidst yourselves. Not even at that difficult time, be amicable, be, be bigger than life. Don't, don't be petty. Uh, petty is a sign of weakness, and it's a sign of low values. Hold you. Hold yourself up high, even though they'll fling dirt and they'll do this and they'll hurt. Bear it, bear it. Allah Rabbul Izza uh, watches and knows what will happen. Um, next sign. Next sign. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so after Fatu Bayt Al Maqdis, he said, Thumma Al Mawatan. Then an extensive death. Mawatan, Sigatul Mubalaga, Kakawlihi Ta'ala, Hayawan. Not Hayawan, as in the animal, Hayawan, as in uh, long life, eternal life, as in reference to the Akhirah. So, then extensive death. And, Ya'khudhu fikum, Kakuasil Ghanam. It will take from you as disease takes from livestock. As disease takes from sheep. You know, when sheep get infected, um, some of the infections, uh, liquid runs from its nose. And then pretty soon the masakin fall down and die. So the Arabs used to call this Amful Mi'zah. Amf knows Mi'za, livestock as in goats or uh, sheep. Amful Mi'za. Uh, when the nose used to run. Does it sound similar to something? Influenza. Amful Mi'za, influenza. Because similar. So the Rasul said it will take from you like Disease takes from livestock, from sheep. So then, uh, in the 18th year after Hijrah, uh, so where was the hadith at? Tabuk. Umar ibn al-Khattab is traveling towards Sham in the 18th year. This is not after the conquest. This is not during the conquest of Palestine, after. He's traveling towards Palestine and he reaches the vicinity of Tabuk. Wallah, every aspect of it is a miracle. He reaches the vicinity of Tabuk. And the generals in the army come out to meet him, to say salam, because he's Khalifa. And when they come, news comes that a pandemic has started in Amwas or Amawas, a locality near Palestine. So then he thinks, what should I do? Should I continue going to um, Baytul Maqdis or Palestine or Bilad al-Sham or return and go back home? So he started to speak with the Sahaba. So he asked for the elders of the Ansar uh, Muhajirun to come. So the immigrants came. And they were divided. Some said go, some said stay. 
So he asked for the Ansar, the Ansar came. What should I do? Some said go, some said stay. Um, I will end with this point, dear ones. Then he asked for the leaders of the Quraysh to come, like as in the Meccans, who are in Mecca. And they all said unanimously, go back. I'll stop at the lesson here because it's important. Number one, consultation is a dictate of deen. بِدَلِيلِ قَوْلِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَا بَيْنَهُمْ And their matters are decided by consultation. So consult. Um, don't be uh, egocentric. You know, hard-headed. My way or the highway. Miskeen, you don't know which way you're going. Now we're going this way. Habibi, GPS says that way. Now we're going this way. You understand? The, consult. Ask the people that are specialists in that area. So you're starting a business. Get someone to do a feasibility study for you. Figure out the population. Figure out your profit and loss. Figure out... Uh, what will work, no, go into it ala basira with clarity. In family matters, you want to go somewhere, not go somewhere, holiday, get yourself, your children, your wife, sit down, say, listen, sweethearts, I'm planning to do this, what do you think? Now, annoying to listen to them, because some of the ideas are out of this world, but okay, because you're training them in responsibility, like when they start thinking about your problems, they start growing the ability to deal with problems. Like part of succession planning, part of training is to consult so that they can get used to um, these matters. At the same time, it gets what they call buy-in, like involvement. Um, there was a, forgive me, I, uh, uh, Sheikh Murtaz, I think you've probably uh, asked for something simple and it became a bit too involved. Uh, but Allah accept from me and from you, Ya Rab. So there was a school case, two schools, both of them were going to close down, like there was no way they would survive. One principal spent six months consulting with the, with the community, called the parents over, uh, listen guys, this is the struggle, we, what should we do? For six months they're trying backwards and forwards until everyone realized that, listen, this is not viable, the school should close down. When it closed down, it went nice and smooth. The other principal knew, another school, knew that the school is going to close down. They didn't say a word to anyone. Kept it, kept it, kept it, kept it. School holiday scam, shut the place down, khalas, done. For five years, she had legal cases after her. Point is, if you bear the awkwardness and discomfort of consultation, the reward is more than not to consult. You with me? So Omar or Omar consulted. He was more learned than them. More, but, and when you consult, listen to the opinion of experts. So notice the muhajirs are there, the people who have done hijrah, the ansar are there, all epitome of piety. Yet Omar opts for the opinion of the leaders of Makkah for different reasons. One being... The Meccans were used to statecraft. Like they were used to running a state. They were used to running a city. They knew the dynamics required for a leader. That if a leader goes, the whole civilization suffers. So they used to make prudent decisions for the state. So Umar radiallahu anhu opted for their decisions. So at times, the expert will not be the sheikh. Like, it's inappropriate, I believe, to get cardiovascular advice from the sheikh. Unless he's, he's a doctor, you know, because separate business. Sheikh Murtada. Yeah, so go to, go, go to a cardiovascular person for that one. And religious and spiritual matters, you go to the sheikh, inshallah. So, لِكُلِّ فَنٍ رِجَال So the second point... Consult, dear ones. Uh, go. Um, 
the points are not finished, but time is finished. Uh, Allah accepts from you. It's been a, such a joy and pleasure to, to be with you. Uh, Allah honor you. Allah elevate you. Allah protect you. Allah guide you. Allah guard you. فَقُلْتُ مَا قُلْتِ إِن تَكُوا حَسَنَةً فَمِنَ اللَّهِ وَإِن تَكُوا سَيِّئَةً فَمِنَ نَفْسِي وَشَيْطَانِ وَسَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُ Have you ever wished that there was a Muslim version of YouTube or Netflix? Well, we have created one. The One Islam TV app has no adverts and is safe to browse for your peace of mind. Watch hundreds of high quality produced Islamic reminders, Quran videos, stories of the prophets, hot topic, debates, and so much more. Four to eight new videos are uploaded daily, inshallah. You can watch or listen to videos while your device is switched off. Watch videos on demand or download videos and watch offline. One Islam TV is 100% run and owned by Muslims, which means the small amount you pay for your subscription is a sadaqa jariya, continuous charity for you, as we use the funds raised to continue producing more beneficial videos and reminders, inshallah. The One Islam TV app is now available on Apple devices, Apple TV, Android devices, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. So you can watch on most devices and smart TVs. Download now for a free 7-day trial. May Allah reward you for supporting our work.